record on that. Welcome to the Society for American Soccer History's SASH session for May with Jorn Buckholtz, the Executive Director of the National Soccer Hall of Fame in Frisco, Texas. Jorn is a good friend of the Society and we're thrilled that he's joining us today. Founded in 1993, SASH works to promote, facilitate, and disseminate research into the rich history and heritage of soccer in the United States. You can find us best in two places, on the web at ussoccerhistory.org or on social media with our Facebook and Twitter accounts. We're happy to report that the society's formal and informal relationship with the hall has grown over the last year or so. Three of our members served on one of three committees, players, veterans, and builders during this year's screening and selection process. And we hope that continues. Also on the informal side, Jorn, our guest today, has often sent us inquiries that come across his desk. Uh, he picks up the bat phone and gives us a call and many of our members uh, have been great resources for those inquiries. We're here today to talk about the most recent iteration of the National Soccer Hall of Fame, but it has had earlier iterations. First, in Philadelphia. If you haven't already, please check out member Ed Farnsworth's excellent post on the SASH website about the Philly days. It's a real treat. The Hall also once had a home in Oneana, New York. And one of the driving forces behind that project was Albert Cologne, a former executive director of the Hall. Sadly, Al passed away a few weeks ago. So could we please pause briefly for a moment of silence in his memory? I was lucky enough to speak with Al over the phone in July of 2020. And he said this, about the Hall's mission during his leadership days. Quote, our mission was to let the American public understand that soccer has as much a history as any other sport in this country. We're about preserving that history to make someone a better fan, a better player, and a better supporter in the future, end quote. I'm sure our guest today would agree with his predecessor from Oneana. Jorn Bokholtz has vast experience at so many levels of American soccer. Before joining the Hall, Jorn spent 20 years in upper management of professional soccer in areas ranging from marketing and operations to administration and public relations. He was a CEO of the Minnesota Stars, Minnesota United of the North American Soccer League, director of fan experience for Sporting KC of Major League Soccer, and president of Louisville City of the United Soccer League. Please welcome Jorn Buckholtz to this SASH session. Thank you, Tom. Thank you everybody for having me. I, uh, although he just walked off the screen, I see the pressure's on with Jack Huckle uh, looking, over, looking over my shoulder. I know, sir, the pressure's on. So um, yeah, so thank you for having me. Uh, you know, Tom uh, asked me about this uh, a couple months ago. Uh, I'm excited to do this. Uh, you know, as Tom mentioned a little bit, you know, our, our relationship with Sash, which I want to talk about a little bit later, has certainly grown since, uh, you know, we really opened up the building and did, you guys did some sessions here. Uh, and as Tom said, you know, for us on the Hall of Fame side, one of the greatest things that's happened out of this is me, we get inquiries all the time. And I don't just want to say, say to people, I, I don't know, because uh, most of the time I don't. I'm going to be honest, I don't. Uh, but to be able to send it to Tom and put up the, you know, the Hall of Fame logo, you know, out into the sky uh, and, and have people come answer the call has been uh, something that's incredibly beneficial beneficial to us. And I, I think probably some people can tell some stories on here, whether it's James or others that have, uh, you know, been able to reply to some people with some photos and just knowledge that these people never even knew about their family members or people that they knew quite well. So that's been a pretty, uh, a pretty amazing partnership so far, and we're looking forward to that growing even further. So, um, you know, as Tom mentioned, uh, I do have a few slides. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to bore the heck out of you. Uh, I promise to not try to do that with just a bunch of slides, but I do want to talk through uh, a few things, um, you know, a little bit about, uh, you know, our history. Um, you know, since we've opened up the building, some, some highlights. Uh, we're going to dive into how 
COVID has affected us uh, a little bit over the last year. We're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about the new induction process that we completely revamped heading into this last year, uh, and then just talk a little bit about what's next. Uh, but mostly, I want this to be you know uh, an open discussion and allow people to answer and ask questions. And if I if I don't know the answer, I'll I'll put the bat signal out to Tom and he'll figure it out for me. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. People see that? We good? All right. So as I mentioned, just a few of the things I want to talk about, uh, you know, just some highlights that we've had um, you know, over the course of our first two and a half years of being open. Um, COVID in the Hall of Fame, uh, our new induction process, and then a little bit about what's next for us uh, as we're thinking about the future. So as I talk about highlights, you know, um, when, when this partnership got off the ground between U.S. Soccer, uh, the city of Frisco, uh, the Hunt family and FC Dallas and, uh, and came together to, to put this building back online, uh, you know, we wanted to be a little bit more innovative. Um, you know, as you all know, the Hall of Fame had just kind of lived in a cloud for several years. So we wanted to change the game, not only inside the building, but our perception out there as well. You know, we needed to come back line in, in a really big way. And, and 2018 was a monumental year for us. So not only did we open it, uh, you know, but we did announce our new class in May of that year. And I think we kind of changed the game in this business a little bit. If some of you remember, um, you know, we decided when we found out who our people were going to be that were going into that class, we wanted to, we wanted to surprise them uh, and surprise them in a way that, you know, really, I don't think had necessarily been done before. So what ended up happening out of that was a lot of planning, uh, a lot of luck, uh, you know, and we were able to announce all five of our candidates in a single day, uh, all across the country. Uh, through various surprises, whether, whether it was, uh, you know, even though Don Garber knew he was going in, uh, you know, we still were able to surprise him, uh, you know, with a, a fake meeting that was set up in the morning. Uh, you know, we had film crews on site in all these areas to capture these moments and did a fake meeting with him uh, where, where uh, Clark Hunt actually popped up on the screen, uh, just to remind him he was going into the Hall of Fame. Uh, we surprised Brad Friedel. We flew in Tab Ramos, who just showed up at a New England Revolution training session. Uh, Brandy Chastain flew to Portland to go let Tiffany Milbert know she was going in. Anson Dorrance, uh, you know, went and surprised uh, Cindy Parlo Cohn. They put together a, uh, a fake youth club meeting uh, where he came and told her. So, and then Dr. Bob was actually with us in Manassas, Virginia, testing all the technology for the Hall of Fame. So I think we changed the game there a little bit. It was kind of interesting. It, as we're preparing to do this again, you know, I tell people it was a little bit of a blessing and a curse that we came out with such a bang because now we've, you know, we've kind of raised the bar uh, and it's something we have to do on an annual basis. And I tell you, it is not an easy thing to pull off to get all of the stars to align on an annual basis, but, but we feel good about it. And I think one of the cool things that came out of it is after we did that in 2018, uh, the following year, you actually saw the Football Hall of Fame, uh, maybe follow our lead a little bit. And instead of just knocking on doors of people, you know, hold up in a hotel room, uh, they started surprising people on live broadcasts and things along those lines. And, and, and we like to feel like we were a little bit of a catalyst for them to change their game a little bit as well. Um, I think another highlight for us was really the opening weekend. Um, you know, we had uh, a lot of the NASL 50th reunion individuals come into town. Uh, we're a part of that entire weekend. I think the ceremony was amazing. The opening of the building, rave reviews. Uh, and then we followed it with an Imagine Dragons full stadium, you know, 25,000 sold out Imagine Dragons concert that evening. And, uh, you know, we were lucky enough to catch them, A, for the right price before they blew up too big and right before they blew up. Uh, and it just ended up being, you know, a, a pretty incredible, incredible weekend. Um, I think another thing we were proud of and, and surprised by was our attendance over the first calendar year, um, you know, between not just people, you know, buying tickets and coming in, uh, but this is also a giant event space and, you know, a place for people on game days to come and, um, you know, our attendance topped just a little bit over 25,000 uh, in our first year, which uh, we had no idea what that number was going to look like. It's hard to budget when you're opening up a brand new building, but we met and, and really exceeded what we thought uh, you know, we were going to do that year. So that was, that was, uh, that was very nice. Um, and you know, when, anytime you're putting up a new building, uh, a new experience, you, you apply for awards out there and we were lucky enough, uh, to win, uh, the gold muse award for research and innovation 
uh, based on the use of our facial recognition technology inside this building that hadn't been used in a space like this before. So we were very proud of that. And then we were a finalist uh, for best venue in the World Football Summit Industry Awards. We did not win. Uh, I, it, was, it was between us, uh, I think, the uh, San Francisco 49ers Stadium and the new Atlanta uh, Falcons Stadium. So uh, we finished third, but hey, we'll take a top three finish when you're talking about venues all across uh, the world. So we were on a roll, obviously, uh, as a lot of people were in the world, uh, and COVID hit us uh, square in the face. Um, you know, we decided to make the decision to close the building in mid-March. Um, but with that being said, you know, we got creative and really started to think about how we could reopen. Uh, we actually ended up being the first, uh, you know, museum space, if you will, to reopen in, uh, in the market. Uh, and we opened up on June 10th, even months before some of the biggest places, biggest museums in the area opened. And we opened up with, you know, mask requirements and we redesigned some of the audio visuals inside of here. So they were intuitively socially distanced. Uh, we limited capacity. We changed our entire ticket platform instead of just, hey, buy a ticket and you can use it anytime. Uh, that is now you buy a ticket uh, for a specific day and a specific hour uh, for you to come through the building so we can control uh, the amount of people uh, coming through it at any one time. But attendance did take a big hit. Uh, you know, we were about down to, we were about a fourth of what we had been, you know, the previous year, uh, maybe about 7,500 people through, you know, really when COVID struck us. So all of, you know, last year, we only had about 7,500 people come through, but I will say, and I'm encouraged to say that over the last six weeks, uh, we've seen more people come through the Hall of Fame than we had seen in the previous six months. Uh, so things are changing. Welcome to Texas. COVID's fake here, right? Sorry, not to be political, but, um, but yes. Uh, so we're, we're excited. Things are reopening. Uh, it's been, uh, it's been fun. So uh, we're getting back to it. Uh, and a piece of that, you know, we've really had to be closed on game days for FC Dallas. A, there were no fans really last year, uh, but now that they've started to allow fans, um, the South end, you know, where our hall of fame is, is really, um, has to be inside of those MLS protocols on keeping it a clean building because the locker rooms are right below us. Uh, the players actually have been coming into the Hall of Fame club to get their COVID tests before they go down to the locker room. So we haven't been able to be open, but that's gonna change for us uh, starting June 27th with the FC Dallas match uh, where we can start to be open uh, in the mornings before games and then for uh, people inside of the building uh, on game day. So we're excited to get back to somewhat of a little bit of a norm. Okay. Now some of the fun stuff. As many of you know, um, you know we really took a lot of the COVID-19 uh, time uh, to think about uh, our induction process. And to be honest, you know we felt over the last several years that the process just wasn't working as well as it could have. You know, I mean, our our goal here at the Hall of Fame is to ensure those of the greatest contribution to the game in this in in this country are getting in. Uh, certainly we were putting those people in, uh, but not enough of them. Uh, and we, and we recognize that. So we, we really took that, uh, this last year to make a complete overhaul that I think does a couple things for us. Um, we were noticing that our ballots were getting incredibly large. Um, our voting committees were over 200 people and we just saw votes going all over the place on, on these ballots and nobody was hitting uh, that 66.6% .6 threshold, or very few people were. So uh, we decided to, A, put in screening committees to bring those, whittle those ballots down to uh, much more manageable numbers um, and, and bring down our voting committee as well, which is actually now 96 individuals in total. And I'll talk a little bit about the results and a little bit of what we saw through that entire process. But one of the things I think we've done is we've guaranteed us a class size of two to four on an annual basis. Uh, most likely it'll be three to four every single year, uh, just based on the parameters we put into place. Uh, we wanted to create a consistent process for screening and voting. Um, you know, unfortunately, when we had 200 and some voters, uh, we were only seeing, you know, sometimes 60% of votes coming in. Uh, you know, so we wanted to create a very consistent process and get the right people in uh, that understood what the process was going to be and bought into it. Uh, and I'm happy to say out of, you know, 96 people on our voting committee, 96 people submitted votes this last year, uh, and we've never hit 100% before. So that was, that was incredibly encouraging. Um, 
Another thing we did uh, on the builder side is we are going to begin rotating that category. This year was an all builder, uh, which we'll have next year uh, is going to be focusing just in on referees. The following year, just coaches. Uh, and then the following year after that, contributors, those are owners, you know, executives, things like that. And we felt that was important. Um, you know, we think there's a lot of great referees, you know, that have been on the ballot for years that aren't just getting the recognition they deserve just because of the competition and that was happening on an annual basis. So we want to hone in on those categories and, uh, and, and, get, uh, and get some of those individuals in. So we're looking forward to that referee category as we think about 2022. Um, I think another thing that was really cool, uh, this was actually Cindy Parlo Cohn's idea, uh, is to make the extended national teams eligible for the National Soccer Hall of Fame. They had never had a path before, and that's the beach soccer teams, futsal, and the uh, para seven aside uh, national teams. And um, when the results come out, I think you're going to be, uh, there's a really good story that's come out uh, of that, of somebody, uh, you know, in, in one of these areas that got incredibly high tallies on votes. And I just think that's a good story uh, that has come out of there. And we hope to see hopefully in the near future, an extended national team individual will go in to the Hall of Fame. So as I mentioned, you know, a standardized class of three to four, we typically will see uh, two players, a veteran and a builder, um, you know, and we can kind of guarantee, you know, those numbers because we've raised, we've, we've lowered what the minimum, very minimum threshold is. And that is at least, uh, you know, for an individual to get into the Hall of Fame on any of the ballots, they need to be on at least 50% of all ballots cast. Um, so we think that, no doubt every year, uh, we're at least going to have a, a person going in to the Hall of Fame. But um, and what we've done uh, is there's some kickers in here, uh, you know, just depending on what happens with the veteran and the builder ballot. Uh, sometimes in those years, there's so many people votes get spread around uh, that somebody doesn't hit that 50% that happened, uh, you know, in 20, uh, a couple years ago. So um, if that happens, there's kickers in place uh, will allow us to put a third player in, you know, just kind of based on some of these parameters uh, that I've outlined below. I don't want to dive into the minutia. If you want to read it in its entirety, uh, it's on our website in about a 15-page uh, document uh, if you really want to dive into, into how that process is working. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, screening and voting committees, uh, and we completely revamped these committees. You know, they're made up of about a third Hall of Famers, a third media and historians, some of the people on this call, uh, and then a third coaches, administrators, and other soccer professionals. Um, and there are, when I, when I think about these committees, there are 24 individuals now uh, who are voting on builder. There are 24 individuals who are voting on veteran uh, and 48 individuals that are voting on the player ballot to get us to our total of 96. So people aren't going across the different ballots because we want them to hone in on, on, on the specific ballots. But when, you know, our goal was to do, you know, this one third, one third, one third, and we, we hit it right on the money. Um, you know, we, when we look at our group, uh, and you know, I know some of you were on the Zoom calls that we would do, uh, you know, for our screening committee, our voting committee, and you, you look around the table who was on those calls, and it was pretty, it's a pretty impressive group of people that wanted to be involved in this process. And that's, that's the direction we wanted to go. At the end of the day, um, you know, we received all of our votes uh, in in February. Um, it's been hard for me to keep who's going into the Hall of Fame in, in, in my own brain and very few people around us. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, we we're incredibly happy with the process. Um, you know, as I'd mentioned before, votes were used to go all over the place. I think having these real conversations with people on the screening committee and the voting committee really allowed the cream of the crop to rise to the top in all three categories. You saw the clear uh, vote getters in each of those uh, and some of them exceeding in some categories over 90% of the vote. That had never happened before. And to be honest, it's something we didn't take into consideration. Um, we fixed the low end uh, of, hey, we need to make sure we're putting in X, X amount of people on an annual basis. We didn't anticipate necessarily that on the high end, we were going to get so many individuals that uh, got so many votes that, uh, you know, this year, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's going to be some people that got really high numbers that aren't going to get into the Hall of Fame in this year because of the current rules. Now, with that said, we've recognized that we never came out of the gates with our new process and said, this is it. This is how we're going to go moving forward for the foreseeable future. 
uh, we're already talking about changes we, we need to make to the process to account for that. Uh, and we have a board meeting in two weeks uh, to talk about those. And hopefully by the time we even announce our new inductees, uh, we're aiming for June, uh, we'll immediately be able to follow that uh, with, with uh, commentary about how the process is gonna change moving forward. Uh, I think one of the keys to this entire process has been transparency on the Hall of Fame side. Uh, there's always been a criticism that nobody knew who was voting, how the votes worked, uh, what was the final tallies of votes, and that's all information that is going to be available and is available. You can go to the Hall of Fame website and you can see the name of every person that's on every committee. Um, and you're going to see when we come out exactly how many votes every single person got because we want to be over transparent uh, during this process. But we know there needs to be some slight changes uh, and we're going to make those uh, heading into getting ready for the 2022 class, uh, which we will begin really this fall. Anybody have any questions so far? I don't mean to be a talking head. Cool. Well, I really got one more slide uh, and then we can open it up. So what's next for us? Um, the induction ceremony was originally scheduled to be in May. Um, you know, we felt with COVID, uh, you know, still pretty rampant that we would move that to October. So we'll be doing that on October 2nd. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a condensed version of the Hall of Fame weekend. That's typically over an entire weekend. We're going to do everything in one day. Uh, induction ceremony luncheon. There's an FC Dallas match uh, that evening, followed by a full stadium Willie Nelson concert uh, that night. So anybody that buys a ticket to the FC Dallas match uh, against Minnesota that evening will also get to stick around uh, and watch Willie play that evening, which we're really excited about. Um, and by the time that happens, to be honest, we'll already be down the path of getting ready for our 2022 class uh, because we want to, uh, as we intended this year, to move induction annually to the spring. Uh, so it's gonna be a quick turnaround again for us. Uh, and we're gearing up for hopefully, uh, we haven't locked it in, but we're looking at May 21st and 22nd for Hall of Fame weekend next year. Uh, so by the time we are announcing our, our or inducting our class for 2021, we'll be in the thick of the 2022 process already. A couple other things that are coming online with the Hall of Fame. We've been working on this for a while, but we're getting our donation platform up and live soon here in probably the next 30 days. Uh, you know, we've had people that have wanted to give to the Hall of Fame. We haven't had an easy way for them to do it. Uh, so we're working on that a page on our site that's going to outline where donations go to. Um, you know, and people actually have the ability to earmark donations for certain things. Um, we're actually, uh, you know, talking to a company right now that um, does customized podcasts. Um, we're gonna modify that a little bit and allow people to basically donate, you know, to do one of these things, pick a hall of famer that they want to hear from. Um, and we'll go out uh, with this company and, and nail that person down for a 30, 45 minute interview. Uh, that person, you know, that did the donation will, uh, be a sponsor of that. And that will live on our website in infamy uh, forever uh, with their name on it. Say, hey, I did this. Um, we'd also live inside the Hall of Fame on the Hall of Fame wall. And I think it's a really cool, cool opportunity for people to donate, to create a legacy piece for the Hall of Fame. It's content for us, which is great. Uh, you know, and hopefully we can get people to donate uh, on that one moving forward. So really excited to launch that uh, here very soon. Um, another thing that we've been discussing about, you know, we've been open, we're creeping up on three years, you know, what changes do we need to start making inside the building, you know, hopefully the women win a uh, Olympic gold medal this year, you know, do we need to think about that. So we're just starting to think about what's next for the Hall of Fame and I would certainly as we go down that path, uh, like to enlist this group uh, on, on what maybe some options are and make sense. I mean, sometimes you guys remind me of anniversaries that wasn't even on my brain. You know, if we can get ahead of those types of things two years out, um, there's an opportunity for us to do something. Cause you know, it does take a year uh, or more, you know, for us to pull some of those things together. So I encourage you, if you've got ideas that make sense, that you think makes sense for the hall of fame and we're a couple of years out, um, let's talk about it. Cause we, we do have a, a couple cases inside of here that can be rotating for exhibits. Uh, so we're certainly open to that. I know you guys ask me all the time, what's going on with the archives in North Carolina? Uh, they are still a mess. I'm not going to lie. Um, some of you have been in there. I know that. 
but it is a topic of discussion. Um, you know, it is ultimately U.S. soccer's archives. Uh, they are starting to earmark some money uh, to put aside to actually get somebody, an organization or something in there uh, to start digitizing, to start really cleaning that place up and ideally get everything to Frisco. Uh, I think long term, you know, absolutely, we would love to have these archives in an organized place in Frisco, they wouldn't be on site here at the building because we just don't have the space, but some place that people like you or, or universities or whoever could come and actually dive into them uh, and do real research. That's that's certainly a long-term goal for us, but first we need to go in there and, and clean the place up. So, um, and lastly, you know, as Tom mentioned, uh, you know, one of the things I want to continue to do is to grow this partnership. You know, as I mentioned, just a couple of things you've heard me talk about, whether it's future exhibits or this group helping me answer questions that randomly come into the Hall of Fame, I think we can start to expand uh, on this and maybe eventually get something on paper, you know, that really makes sense, that gives credibility, I think, to each of us moving forward. So that's something I'm really excited uh, to continue to talk about as, as we move forward. So, Tom, that is the end of my right. slide well, thank presentation. You. I right. see all the people Thank you. turn off their people turn off their cameras because they fell asleep and that's okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Thank you uh, very much for for the, you know the recap of what's been going on um, through what's going on currently and uh, into the future. And and I know we have some uh, some eager uh, people that to ask some questions. I don't see any specifically in the queue. Uh, right now, but we didn't say to leave those questions there, but we can keep an eye on that if, uh, if folks uh, can't speak up or, or choose not to, but uh, uh, I'm going to open up the floor uh, to, to any of our uh, members or guests here uh, to uh, fire away. It's not every day that you have the executive director of the National Soccer Hall of Fame uh, captive uh, audience. So uh, please, somebody Step up and ask that first question. If not, I'm going to go to uh, Kevin Talek Marston, uh, who always has the best questions. Got a shy group uh, today. Okay, I'll ask. I'll ask. Uh, um, a tough, harding question. Um, first, why should historians of American soccer um, be interested in in the Hall of Fame and what's going on there, and and maybe even vice versa? Why should the Hall be interested in in historians and and in particular our society? Well, I mean, I think. Just, just even yesterday, Tom, you know, when I, I was following some of the tweets and, you know, up popped the story about, which I think you mentioned earlier about the history of the Hall of Fame. I mean, I, I knew some of that. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know all of it, you know, and I, I think that's what's really interesting. And, and even as we were bringing this, this um, Hall of Fame online, I am not going to pretend uh, that I am an expert in the history of the game in this country pre-1994, to be honest. Um, you know, my expertise has really been in 1994 and to current. Uh, it's part of the reason why Jim Trecker was so highly involved in the process. We were kind of a good team. It was kind of a Batman Robin. I keep using that uh, analogy, you know, but, uh, you know, he was the one that could tell me about the history before. And I think it's just important that, um, you know, whether it is about new exhibits and anniversaries coming up, I, I don't know these things, um, a lot of them. And I am, uh, uh, I'm a one man show, you know, at a lot of times. Um, we've got two full-time employees at the Hall of Fame, which is, you know, the relationship that we have with FC Dallas. We use them for a lot of our um, media and communications and marketing and all of that stuff. But really two of us full-time here, me as the executive director and another individual, Santiago, who really runs it when we're open, right? Uh, so he's just involved in the day-to-day -day operations. So we need the assistance, you know, and I think that's what's been really great about, you know, historians on here reminding us about, you know, things coming up and uh, we want to be a resource for people, but unfortunately I don't have the knowledge to be a resource for everybody. So 
uh, you know, as individuals like you are able to help us, I, I, I think it's just been an incredible partnership so far. And as I mentioned before, we're looking forward to, to really growing it. Thank you for that. Came out of the gate strong, but uh, <laughs> I'm gonna as we wait uh, for for someone else to. to Kevin's step got up, his I'll hand. Ask you, oh, Kevin! Oh, I see a hand, yellow hand. Go ahead, Kevin. Do you got, you can hear me, Jor? Yep. Cool. Good. Um, great to see you. Thanks so much. Um, I I wanted to pick up on the 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 anniversary bit that you that you talked about and kind of the dates and calendars. This was an idea that, you know, some of us had been throwing around over the last, you know, two years is uh, I know that, you know, there are, there are, you know, the Roger Litter's, uh, you know, online website, which is an absolute gold mine of information, um, but it's hard to exploit in a planning. I'm, I'm trying to think about it in a kind of project management perspective. Um, for you guys, if you're trying to plan ahead, whether it's exhibits, uh, celebrations, anniversaries, etc., cetera, um, and we can help um, with material, with stories, with, you know, the, the storytelling business, um, I just wondered what, uh, you know, what, how, how we can work together more on, on that planning process in order to help you guys. One of the ideas that, um, that I had floated with various other people in, the, in, in this group uh, was, the, was trying to put together a calendar in advance um, that would be, you know, there's a, there's a website, the Baseball History website, which is a fabulous website, which literally you just click on it and it tells you this day in baseball, it ha you know, this happened. And it gives you year by year, you know, various, you know, tidbits and things. And I was just thinking, is there a way on the, you know, maybe that's something where we could work together between Sash and the Hall's website to have some sort of uh, repository, like a, a calendar thing that would, you know, when you get onto the Sash website today, this happened. And if we can use, I mean, because all of the, the knowledge is, is in this group, it's written in people's, you know, books and articles and stuff, and it's all there. All we need to do is find a way to kind of uh, code it in an Excel database so that you guys have a, a resource. Is that, is that make any sense to you? Does it sound yeah. interesting? How, how could we go about exploiting that to better kind of bring our community and the hall's needs together? That was kind of my question. Yeah, I mean, I'm mean, even thinking about, you know, I mean, even if people, you know, pop up on the Hall of Fame's website and there's, a, you know, the fact of the day, you know, hey, 30 years ago, this happened. I mean, I think absolutely that's something we could bring to our, our, our web developers to get done. I just, I just don't have that in a spot. You know, I, I don't know all of those things, you know, I mean, U S soccer gave us one when we, you know, the first year we opened up the building and, you know, maybe you'd seen, you know, for the first year we were, you know, creating tweets or, you know, Facebook posts or whatever about, Hey, you know, 20 years ago, this happened. Uh, but it was a lot of current modern, you know, U S soccer history. Uh, and what probably wasn't much older than, you know, 1990, um, so, I mean, yeah, if we could work together to get all of that information into one spot, right. And it's going to be something that we're going to continue to add to all the time, you know, uh, whether, you know, who knows what's happening. Alex Morgan scores five goals, uh, you know, in, in a world cup match, you know, that needs to go into that spreadsheet, uh, or whatever that format is. Uh, and I think that's something that we can work together to continue to build. Um, you know, we just have to figure it out on the hall of fame page. And I, I think it should live, you know, on your guys' website on, the hall of fames, you know, we're continuing to try to add content to our website. And I think that's a pretty, that's a pretty cool piece. Yeah. Cool. I see David Kilpatrick has his hand up. David. Maybe not. Jack Huckle with his hand. All right. Hi, Bjorn. Hi, Tom and everybody else. Um, I think the Bjorn, the election process is always an iterative process. I think we changed every three years for 10 years or so, just learning what what happens. And that, you know, you're going to fix a, a tweak this year and next year something else will happen that I'll say, oh, we didn't think of that either. 
So congratulations on the tweaks and particularly the participation. I think that's, that's really important to Thank have you. good participation because that gives some credibility to the results. Yep. And your commitment to uh, transparency of results. That was something I worked at as well. And, and I think those things are really important. Yeah. Um, so those are, those are all great things you're coming up with. Of course, the one event that comes to mind, it, it's almost too late for you to do anything about is 25th year of the 96 opening of the women in the Olympics in, in the first Olympic gold, uh, the first Olympic gold medal in women's soccer. Um, those are the, you know, the big events you're coming up though in 24 will be the 25th from the 99 women's event. Yep. And so I'm sure that's on your list somewhere. Yep. That's and that's Kevin's fun. idea. I love the idea of Kevin because for a long time, I, I, when I was working, I had a, my own spreadsheet that if something happened today, I created it. And so if I can find it, I'll send it to you, Dior. Okay. The, yeah, that, that'd be great. And so it has some of those things. Thanks for doing this. I'm excited about all the, the, um, the progress you've made and the things you're doing and, and wish you all the best of luck. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. I mean, it wouldn't, this, this wouldn't be happening without all of your hard work for, for many years. And Jack, I did want to tell you, I actually got a, I received two boxes uh, maybe about a month ago, full of folders with old NASL slides and little photos that, had been loaned out to somebody for a research project, God knows how long ago. And this person just moved uh, and said, hey, I found all of these, I need to send them back to you. So it, I just opened up, we, we finally cleaned my office yesterday where a lot of this stuff was living. And I got an entire box full of slides uh, from just, just NASL photos. I, I don't know if you remember who that went to or loaning that out, but we have it back now. Well, I, I don't remember, I don't remember of course, it, we had thousands, as you know, there are thousands of them already yep. in, in uh, North Carolina, never mind the additions you're making. Yeah. Great to hear that they're back in possession where yeah. people who are writing can uh, search through them at some point and add to their materials. Yes. Thank you, Jack. We're gonna give David Kilpatrick another chance to chime in. If not, I have a, a, a written question uh, from the queue. And we also have uh, a written question from Patrick Salkel that I can uh, paraphrase. Uh, David, are you able to join us with the audio? All right, perhaps he's having trouble. Uh, it's another anniversary uh, observation. So, this marks the 100th anniversary of the formation of the American Soccer League. Today uh, marks that. It's almost impossible uh, for not already inducted players, veterans from that area uh, to be in one of these current categories, player, veteran, builder. Um, since David can't be uh, heard, what about a fourth category for the hall, he says? <laughs> maybe a pioneers or founders category for those who have been um, deceased for 50 years or more. So I guess that's a very specific question, but the more general question, is there um, discussion going on about how to include some of these, these folks who really have no prospect of getting into the hall for, for one reason or another? Yeah, we've been talking about this on the board level. I mean, to be honest, we wanted to get our current process in a much better shape. That's where a lot of the focus has been. But on our radar screen, uh, you know, has been, you know, individuals that we feel, uh, to your point, have, have been deceased for 50 years that we feel, you know, have no chance of getting in. 
Um, we're looking at the option of on the fifth anniversary of the Hall of Fame being open, uh, maybe doing some type of sweeping, you know, looking at who's been left off that we feel uh, really deserves to be in on the fifth anniversary of the Hall of Fame being open and and doing a much larger class, whether that is, yeah, they're still Hall of Famers, but whether that is a pioneer type uh, situation, that is on our radar screen for um, for our fifth anniversary. And I think it is something you'll see come down the pipeline. I don't know that we'll put in uh, a specific category that would be voted on on an annual basis. That gets really it gets really difficult, I think, trying to maybe for some people separate what a builder is and maybe what a pioneer is and uh, it maybe gets a little bit muddied. Um, but I do think there's an opportunity for us, whether it's every you know five years, especially on the fifth anniversary of the Hall of Fame, every 10 years, something like that, of really looking back uh, to see who had a major impact that's been left off uh, and and try to get them in. So I, we, it is on it is on our radar screen, absolutely. And trust me, we're going to be coming to you for help and lists of who we feel should be in that group. So, fair enough. Thank you for that. Uh, and hopefully, David was was uh, able to to listen in there. If not, uh, the recording. Patrick Salkeld from North Carolina. Uh, probably the closest individual on this call uh, to uh, Hillsboro and the collection there has this question. Uh, he's in the museum and archive space and his question is about conservation and preservation of uh, objects and exhibits. Uh, so regarding these display changes uh, and you know, behind the scenes aspect, does the hall have museum professionals employed to help write, interpret exhibits, um, and conserve or preserve objects uh, on the site? Uh, or will they uh, be in the future, particularly, you know, in the care of the, the archives? So I guess the general question is there is, is um, you know, artifacts, their preservation, their conservation, and uh, is the hall in discussion with folks? Um, from an archival standpoint, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that is a U.S. soccer, and we've been speaking to Will Wilson, the new CEO of U.S. soccer, about the importance of what needs to happen down in North Carolina. Um, so that is on discussion, and I know there, he, there was even a mention of, uh, you know, do you, is, do you need volunteers or something like that? And I think the answer will potentially be yes at some point. Uh, you know, uh, if, if there are people that want to help in that process, we, we are all about it. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit through what happens, you know, when new items are coming in. Um, I am ashamed to admit it's not incredibly scientific at this point. Uh, you know, things are coming into our office. Uh, you know, we are taking them, uh, whether it's all the champions jerseys from, you know, the previous year, you know, after they've been on display, we'll take them, uh, you know, bag them uh, in these specific uh, bags, uh, mark them. They go on a spreadsheet. Uh, you know, they're going into, you know, currently bins right now. Uh, of specific years. And I, I think to, to your point, that process needs to be much more professional as we're really talking about, uh, you know, preserving some of, of these items. Um, I will say maybe that's an opportunity to enlist, you know, maybe some ideas from this group as well. If there's if anybody has relationships with organizations that does these types of things. Um, it, but like I mentioned, I mean, it's not a, it's not an incredibly scientific process right now, but that probably needs to change if we're talking about the long-term preservation of some items. A lot of stuff we're getting in right now is not necessarily items that uh, are old, um, except for when somebody sends me slides from the NASL. Um, you know, a lot of it is new stuff we're thinking about as it happens. Uh, hey, get me that ball from that Jill Ellis's 100th win or whatever it is. Uh, you know, get me those types of things and we're taking them. But that that process does need to be uh, much more professional than it is currently. All right, I think those are the two outstanding questions from, from the, the chat. Um, do we have anybody here on the call that would like, uh, 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 Chuck Carlson I see has uh, his hand uh, raised. Chuck from, 
the great state of Illinois, Chicago, to be exact. Unfortunately, I'm in Wisconsin at the moment, but uh, my work is being done in Chicago. And that, um, Jordan, thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, and I, I reached out to you individually on the chat about volunteering and the idea oh, yes, in so North Carolina. Um, that's, um, uh, I'm wondering if you've looked into any consulting companies that do archival consulting, uh, 12 years ago, I did the Lyric Opera of Chicago, where I walked into a giant room full of stuff all just packed on top of each other. And after a two, two and a half year process was able to get everything into proper order, create a finding aid that people can use. And so there, there are definitely resources out there that you can pay for, but I'm guaranteeing you there are also plenty of people who have experience that would help out. Um, so uh, just, I guess, in a sense, offering up my past experience and other people's past experience um, for organizing yeah. that stuff. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that, Chuck. And maybe, um, I know Tom, Tom's got my email. You know, maybe you can, or you can probably find it, or I can give it to you. It's just Jorn, D-J-O-R-N, at national soccer hof.com but maybe send me a note uh this will maybe be another opportunity for me to uh to give a swift kick to u.s soccer uh to start you know really thinking about this process again we had the conversation probably four months ago it needs to i need to keep hitting them you know and letting them know that there's people that are willing to help and, and maybe help lead this process i think and be important because i'll be honest i think the, there were they were talking to some companies a couple of years ago about this, and I think the sticker shock uh, of what they wanted to charge maybe uh, put it a little bit more on a back burner. So um, you know, if there's opportunities to hey, you know, bring in a firm like that, but also have volunteers to maybe uh, you know mitigate some of the costs, I think is 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 an opportunity for sure. Great, thank and you. And I'm going to pig. Thanks, Chuck, for that. I'm going to piggyback on that because. Um, in committee calls uh, for you know the society, we, we've talked about the, this very thing, right? As a um, as a potential uh, research slash you know volunteer slash you know offer our expertise because many of our members have uh, you know spent time in archives and some of them are actual you know archives and museum you know professionals. So yeah, amongst our group. Um, we, we have some of these, you know, very people and we've talked about, hey, wouldn't it be great if we just all picked, uh, you know, a, a week and we, you know, a, a half a dozen of us or whatever, you know, came in, you know, volunteered, helped out. So um, I like to call this group a loose confederation of kindred spirits, maybe a less flattering nickname would be, you know, my fellow soccer nerds. Um, but uh, there, there are people who, who would uh, be willing to volunteer um, and, and happy to do so, and, and, and it would be a thrill for them. So I, I think that should, you know, we should have further discussion about that and how, what that might look like in, in the next six months to a year. Yeah, no, Tom, I think that's really interesting because, I mean, it would be fun and probably incredibly helpful, not that we would get it in its final form, but at least get, you know, a group down there to at least get it in much better shape, right? To start, because uh, I'm sure right now the the price tag for a company to come in and do it is looking at an entire, an entire warehouse just full of boxes all over the place, right? And that's probably part of where that cost uh, is through the roof, you know? And if a group of us could go down there for a week and just somewhat get it organized, you know, before, uh, you know, we potentially get in, you know, professionals with still with the help of this group to get it in a much better place before it makes its way to Frisco. I think that's, I think it's a really interesting concept if people would be willing to go and do that, you know. You know, for example, one of the trips that I took down there, uh, I went with two other folks. We met in Baltimore, drove down to North Carolina, uh, I think we spent three days there, two nights at a hotel and, and then back. So, I mean, it's, it's possible. Um, and then, yeah, if you met us, you can make some executive decisions and, and, you know, based on maybe some consultations with, with us, it could be, could be interesting. 
Yeah, yeah no, I, th I think that's see. good. And I, I think the Hall of Fame, you know, would be able to come up with obviously flights and hotels and all of that stuff to, to get this group taken care of because I don't want you to come out of pocket for that either. So um, absolutely, let's put that on the table as we continue to grow this partnership. I think that's a really cool one and that'd be fun. Right, and uh, someone in the chat just said, as long as U.S. soccer pays for some uh, North Carolina barbecue, we're in, right? We can do that. It's not as good as Texas barbecue, <laughs> but yeah, we can do that. Um, Kevin, I see another question. Please fire away. I think Je Jeff Jeffrey has a hand up as well. Oh, he's had that hand up for a little bit. Am I? If I'm sorry, Jeffrey. Jeffrey and then Kevin. Hey, um, Jordan, uh, fellow Texan here, um, southern part of the state. Um, and so I follow very closely what's happened with the Hall of Fame. And um, I was fortunate enough to actually have a chance to visit uh, the Hall of Fame in New York uh, on two or three years before it actually closed. And uh, it came on the heels of having gone to the Baseball Hall of Fame the day before. And, and frankly, it was quite a, uh, a shock, to be honest with you, to go from one to the other, to see the reaction and what was going on. And so I, I think what you've done and the way you're approaching things um, in terms of outreach and, and not making it a museum, but making it a more of an experience is a really good thing. And I look forward to getting up there and uh, you know, once this whole thing is all done, uh, to get up there and see this thing. But the one thing that struck me and, and listening to this conversation that we've had from other people from SASH is that I, I would like to see personally myself also a greater balance between the experience part of it and what you need to do to basically get the excitement to, you know, to make things happen. And at the same time, you know, with more of a nod to the history. Um, so I would, I would love to see um, and would be willing to you know, participate on any level, um, a much greater collaboration between SASH and, uh, and the, the National Soccer Hall of Fame to actually make that happen. Yep. You know, it's uh, one thing I did, for example, was I went in and tried to find all the Texans who were involved in the, in the National Soccer Hall of Fame because I do um, some Texas soccer history sort of stuff. And that was an extraordinarily difficult process. And there's a lot of people that are in the Hall of Fame, many of whom I'd never heard of. And I think there's a lot of work that could be done to actually bring more of that to life. And I think that, you know, understanding your resource limitations and what you're doing within the framework of the FC Dallas organization, that's something that potentially SASH could do. And, and uh, I would highly encourage all of us and some of the ideas that Kevin came up with earlier and other sorts of things to, you know, even put together some sort of a potential subcommittee, um, you know, of people who would be, who would work within SASH to come up with ideas um, on collaboration efforts um, and try to deliver, right, for the, deliver that from that standpoint. So that's just my opinion and my thought. And, and again, um, I'm, I'm extraordinarily happy that uh, the Hall of Fame came back to life and that uh, FC Dallas, the Hunts, uh, the city of Frisco, Frisco ISD, and other people that are involved up there were able to put the money behind um, making that actually happen. And that it's in our great state. So yep. um, I do, like, again, I look forward to getting up and seeing you at some point in the future, but uh, let's just figure out a way how to keep the collaboration going. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree, Jeffrey. And I think, you know, it's just another step in the process is, you know, doing this, this, you know, phone call or Zoom or whatever you want to call it. Uh, just more introductions, uh, you know, allowing us to, to use our brains and think about what's potentially next. But yeah, to, to your point, yeah, we need to focus more on the history. I, I'll be honest, a lot of the, well, not a lot of it. I mean, a bunch of the history in here is, you know, probably a little bit more modern. Um, you know, we, we still, we can't lose sight of, you know, really our founders, our pioneers. Uh, we probably need to be telling those stories more. Uh, I just need to, I just need some help on when those stories are available, uh, when you know anniversaries, things like that happen, and we we certainly want to want to share that more. So let's keep collaborating, absolutely. And let me know when you're going to be up here, private tour for you. So, um, before we go to uh, Kevin's second question, uh, James Brown, uh, Vice President of SASH, uh, wrote in. Uh, some of the results of one of those bat phone calls. Uh, he has uh, been researching uh, the Craddock family and uh, there's a bit of a personal touch, a personal factor for James because he has done the same thing for his family, kind of putting together a, a sporting family history. He's uh, delved into the Craddock family and, and there's going to be a book or a, you know, a, 
compilation of these articles that he's been finding to, to be given to the 94 year old grandmother. Um, so that, that's going to be happening soon. So uh, uh, James perhaps has the biggest heart and sash, uh, but this is very personal to him. So he's put that together. Uh, so congrats to him. But that that came out of one of these calls, um, you know, that that came from you uh, to Sash. Uh, so so kudos uh, to James. Uh, so we'll uh, push it over to Kevin um, for for his next question. I don't want to take someone else's spot if there's someone else who hasn't asked a question before. So. If not, it was just more um, just a sense because I'm I am one of the one of the people who has not had a chance to get to Hillsboro, and it kind of picks up on what Patrick was talking about in terms of conservation. Um, is there any? It's just one of these things that keeps me up at night. Is there any any risk that some hurricane just comes in and wipes out everything that's in uh, the building that knocks it down it, it, from a concrete like? I mean, you know, I. I Stupid example, the, the UEFA archives here in Switzerland, when they first cataloged everything 10 years ago, and I was there for, for much of the beginning of that, um, they had stored all of their boxes, like their, their our institutional history was all under the water pipes in the basement of this brand new building, like it's beautiful, you know, headquarters, but nobody had thought to take it out of that space, which was literally just an accident waiting to happen. And so I was just kind of wondering, has anybody done a just kind of a risk management assessment of the building and make sure that the stuff that is the most, you know, potentially humidity uh, at risk or, or that sort of thing, is there, is there a risk there or is that just, I mean, I, again, and I, I don't want to put pressure on you, Jordan, because I know you are overworked and you have limited resources, but is that something where, you know, has that process been, has that, you know, has anybody thought about the the environmental? Probably not, to be honest, Kevin. Um, you know, I will say, uh, you know, as, as we think about those archives, probably the most important or historical items are now here in Frisco. Um, there, there is that, um, you know, we, we made sure, but there's probably still some stuff in boxes that haven't even been opened that we're unaware of. Um, you know, so I, I, I think that process, I, I think a risk management of that building is probably a, a good idea. I mean, another thing we run the risk of is soccer.com saying, hey, we're moving. Um, you know, they've been nice enough to give us literally a oh, 20,000 square foot space inside their building for free for 11 years, which is unheard of. Uh, we run that risk as well, you know, so uh, this entire process is something that needs to happen sooner, sooner than later. And yeah, I don't think things are sitting under water pipes. I think I would have seen that when I was there. Uh, but that's been three years. And I don't know that I was looking for water pipes. So that's a that's, that's a fair assessment. Yes. And, and just connected to that in Chicago, I had understood that there actually is material um, in Chicago soccer house as well. That's separate from that. Um, am I right on that? There is some stuff. Uh, mo well, there's, there's some boxes of stuff. We haven't really dove into them a whole lot. I know Jim Trecker did made a trip up there at one point. Um, it's a lot of photos, uh, is what a lot of the stuff is, but yeah, there are some, some items still there, not a lot, uh, but there are some stuff in Chicago. A lot of that stuff got boxed and sent here predominantly you know trophies and, and and things like that so uh but yeah that's another place we need to we need to go explore i'm going to fire away with one observation and then a, a question we've talked about uh email and i think it came into your inbox the the, one of the needles in the Hillsboro haystack is a hard drive. And the way that it's been described to me by Jack Huckle years ago, and maybe even Roger, um, is a hard drive that could have been pulled out of like a PC tower and wrapped up and sent. And on this hard drive are scans of photographs 
of some of the earliest images in American soccer history from the 1880s, 1890s, stuff that would have been scanned by James Brown's mother when she was working at the National Soccer Hall of Fame. Um, so well, wow. please keep I, an eye out I didn't know that. You know, for that. Yeah. So if there's there's any hard drive that kind of pops up, oh, what's on this? You know, please, please check that uh, out. And then um, when you were talking about these display cases, uh, one or two, you know, at the current hall that that could rotate. Is there um, a possibility, I'm just going to raise it, you don't have to answer, we can maybe talk about it offline if that's more appropriate, where SASH could use its expertise, perhaps even one member who's focusing in on something, perhaps an anniversary, and they could, could between what the hall has, what they have, you know, create a mini exhibit that somebody could look, oh, it's the 100th anniversary of the American Soccer League. You know, here's a jersey, here's, you know, a, a contract of a player, here's a medal, you know, and, and you know, we'll author, you know, we being Sash or, or, or a member, uh, the placards, and, and maybe even getting those printed and deliver and, and, you know, display it on our end, take a picture and say, hey, this is how we would display it and then leave it to you guys uh, down there to do that. Is, is that something that could be possible? Yeah, Tom, I think 100%. Um, you know, I, again, I, I don't necessarily have all of the knowledge of, of these items, you know, uh, or of these anniversaries or things coming up. And I think that, you know, as we continue to build this partnership, if it is a, even call it a sash case, right, where you guys have the ability to, ah. to do, you know, something that you want inside of there. I mean, it, it's, it's rotating content for us, right? I think having, you know, a sash case inside of the hall of fame gives you a little bit of credibility, you know, with maybe your logo in there, yeah. you know, is your case uh, where you guys get to do something, you know, whether it's, I mean, we don't want to rotate it multiple times in a year. Right. You know, so I think it's things of something that is coming up and Hey, well, if the anniversary is in December, let's get stuff up for January and it's through that entire year. And, you know, we think about what's next. I mean, there's always a monetary component right. to it, um, you know, to switch out a case, you know, is probably a eight to $10,000 venture, um, you know, when we're putting in all of the mounts and, you know, production and graphics and all of that. So um, that is one of the reasons why we're trying to get our fundraising up and off the ground because that goes into what's called the experience fund and the only thing it can be used for is to improve uh the inside of the hall of fame and that's where this stuff would would come out of for uh to be paid for so i think absolutely i think that's actually a really really cool idea thank you someone just hashtag sash case, sash case. um and I did see that David, David Kilpatrick said that things are safe in the basement in, in uh, Hillsborough. So that's good. Any more questions? There was one just written in the chat that might be a good one to, to end on. Um, anybody else with, with a pressing question? All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll end with this. I mean, thank you for, for joining us. Um, you know, I think you've, we've answered this, uh, you know, a little bit, but, you know, how can we be of service? Um, how can, you know, the hall use us as, as a group, uh, as individuals, uh, basically, how can we help? Yep. I think, uh, I think Tom, as we've mentioned several times, I think the coolest things that's happened so far is the bat signal, you know, and being able to create uh you know really content and i think experiences for people like you know james is doing um you know i was director of fan experience at kansas city and i'm always thinking about that individual touch and i think uh not that we want to just be a place where everybody sends their questions and we're going to turn around and answer them and i know tom we've had a couple come in where i've looked at them later and said you know maybe this isn't in our wheelhouse because it doesn't really necessarily touch us but i think I think that's been incredible. And I think that's something I, I wanna to continue to expand on. I think the archives are an important one. How can we work together to figure out what to do there? Are there people you know, within your group or even not within your group that would be interested 
in uh, in that process. Um, I think you know to Kevin's point about you know do we create some type of uh, spreadsheet or some type of program you know that we are collectively looking at historical dates and continuing to add to as things happen and how can we recall that information on the SASH site on on the Hall of Fame site uh, and I think the potential you know for you guys really to help us guide us on um, on a rotating case you know uh, you know what do we want to celebrate that's coming up whether it is incredibly historical or it's the 20, you know, the 25th anniversary of the 1999 women's championship, you know, I think, uh, you know, us working together to think about that and then collaborating to actually pull the exhibit off, I think is something that uh, is another piece that we can, that we can work on. That was kind of four bullet points, I think. I don't know if I missed anything off the bat, but um, at the end of the day, I've just been incredible. To be honest, five years ago, I didn't even know you guys existed. Uh, five years ago, I didn't know I'd be here at the Hall of Fame. So, uh, you know, just uh, uh, the way this relationship has changed uh, and grown over the last few years has been incredibly exciting. And uh, I'm very thankful, you know, to people that have been helpful, Tom, uh, you know, Kevin, James, you know, that have helped in, in, in this process, especially when we got questions. Because again, I think those experiences that, you know, James is creating for people, uh, it's just really goodwill. And I love doing goodwill type things like that, that uh, is really feel good. And I think even said in his, in his note that he put over to the side that I think through this process, he's, it looks like they're going to get inducted into the Pennsylvania Sports Hall of Fame because of this initial email that came in. I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible stuff. So uh, just excited and, and excited to keep it going. And yeah, I, I would say those are kind of I think our four pillars right now that we should continue to elaborate on and figure out, uh, maybe formalize it at some point down the road and, and create a real partnership. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time on, uh, on a Friday afternoon. Um, Want to say to uh, the SASH membership, we have a, a program that in the works for uh, two weeks from now, there is a new book Everton Football Club and North America uh, that is coming out. And it looks like Patrick Sullivan uh, is going to help coordinate a program between one of the authors, uh, someone in charge of Everton USA. And it will be done on that Sunday, May 16th, an hour or so uh, before uh, an Everton uh, kickoff in the Premier League. So uh, look for, for news on that in the coming weeks. Uh, we have future programs. Uh, Kevin was mentioned, uh, he is putting together something on uh, youth soccer in, uh, in the United States, the history of youth soccer uh, in the United States. And we have some other programs uh, planned uh, throughout the, the summer months and into the fall. Uh, so uh, please join us for those. If you have any ideas, uh, please uh, send them uh, in via the website or to one of us individually, we'll make sure it gets to the group. And finally, one of our members will have a book published, uh, hopefully in the summer months, and that's Brian Bunk, who has a book on 19th century uh, American soccer. And then another board member, George Kiosis, is one of the co-editors uh, of uh, a collection. Many SASH members uh, are uh, have authored chapters in it, uh, and it is a book on uh, American soccer pre-1913, pre the formation uh, of United States Soccer Federation. So uh, look out for those, support one another, and uh, thank you for another great uh, get together. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, everybody.